clinical results. It's not yeah. experiments on, on mouse. Yes. It's clinical results in humans. Yeah, yeah. This is my opinion. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate your thorough good. answer. Good. It was wonderful. I did a good job for Professor Avelli. I hope so. Oh, yeah, we did our best. <laughs> you did. You definitely did. You definitely did. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So you thought of uh, some uh, diseases that I'm dealing with, such as fibromyalgia, arthritis, and so on and so forth. Hmm. So we have many points of contact. Uh, yes, Professor Ravadi, we are all ears with you. Thank you for your patience and your cooperation. So sh what should I do? Should I start my lecture? Yes, yes, please, please. So let me sh share the screen. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Do you see my slides? Yes, it is. It is very lovely. nice. Yes. Sir. Okay. Okay. So, th thank you uh, very much first for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be with you tonight, uh, uh, even though unfortunately not in person. I hopefully there will be another occasion in the future. I've been to Tehran once a few years ago. Hope to come back uh, one day. So uh, uh, let me first introduce myself. I'm Angelo Ravelli. I'm the uh, head of the rheumatology unit at the Instit Gazzini Institute of Genoa, Italy. I'm a pediatric rheumatologist, and I'm actually also the president of the European Pediatric Rheumatology Society. So uh, I'm, I'm very pleased that you have asked me to present uh, the multinational efforts project that has led to develop the what uh, are now called the 2016 classification criteria for macrophage activation syndrome complicating uh, systemic joint idiopathic arthritis. But let me start uh, reminding you why classification uh, criteria, we, we can't nowadays uh, call any criteria for a disease as diagnostic for med medical legal reasons, uh, why criteria for MAS are important. So as you all know, uh, MAS is a serious complication of pediatric rheumatic diseases, particularly of systemic uh, joint idiopathic arthritis, which can be life-threatening. And early diagnosis and uh, the prompt institution of uh, a correct, uh, appropriate treatment are critical. It can be uh, life-saving for the patients. However, uh, everybody knows that uh, because there are no distinguishing or pathognomonic features, and MAS can be heterogeneous in its clinical uh, pictures, early, timely diagnosis can be difficult. And uh, furthermore, uh, uh, the features of uh, the clinical and laboratory features of MAS can, can be mimicked by some uh, 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 clinical uh, conditions such as a flare, a simple flare of the underlying systemic uh, uh, JIA and infectious complications, for instance, leishmania or EBV related uh, HLH may mimic uh, the features of macrophage activation syndrome and also some medication side effects, uh, particularly when there is liver, liver failure may also uh, be difficult to uh, discriminate uh, from MAS. But on top of that, there are reports such as this one by a group uh, of uh, uh, US colleagues and friends, I should say, which has suggested that MAS may be indeed much more common than usually thought in the uh, context of active systemic JA. And nowadays, it is uh, uh, widely realized that overt full-blown MAS occurs in 8 to 10% of children with uh, uh, systemic JA, but another 20, 30, or perhaps even 40% of children with this disease may display subclinical signs of MAS, which if not recognized and treated promptly, may progress towards a, a full-blown and potentially life-threatening uh, mm, uh, syn um, con syndrome. So what are the aims of classification criteria, the general aims? Of course, they help uh, uh, standardize the classification uh, of the syndrome for research purposes of, of, or, or publication. Uh, so make sure that, uh, that uh, patients included in, in studies or in trials really have MAS and not something else because the criteria should unify the uh, classification. They may assist in the evaluation of different therapeutic approaches because they make more rational the conduction of trials. And uh, they also may foster interaction between specialists in different fields because uh, MAS and hemophagocytic syndrome not only 
involve the interest of uh, rheumatologists, but also of uh, immunologists, infectious disease specialists, uh, intensivists, uh, and uh, uh, cardiologists, uh, and others. So this uh, uh, having shared criteria uh, enable these specialists to talk the same language. So they, they talk about the, the same condition, not to something uh, that is called in the different way by each specialist. And last but not least, they may also, the well-established criteria may help the uh, caring physician, the treating physician to make uh, an early diagnosis of the disease. So we, our group has been long interested in the uh, uh, creation of criteria for MAS in system AGA, and these are the time-honored preliminary diagnostic guidelines for this syndrome, which were published uh, in the Journal of Pediatrics already uh, uh, 15 years ago. Uh, I have no time to go through these criteria. There are, they include four laboratory criteria, three clinical criteria, and uh, uh, these criteria, uh, of course, are nowadays old. They are a bit outdated. They do not incorporate the most recent uh, uh, development, but they have played a very important role be because they have uh, uh, very much uh, helped to uh, disseminate the awareness for this uh, syndrome, which was not enough uh, known by physicians out of the context of hematologists and rheumatologists. And I think they have helped to save a number of children's life. Uh, anyway, as I said, they are now uh, a bit, uh, they, they are, are get, have got a bit old. They were based, based on retrospective data, do not incorporate some uh, laboratory measurements that are uh, nowadays we know that are very important, primarily ferritin, because at that time, uh, the role of this, uh, uh, this uh, biomarkers was not uh, yet uh, recognized. And last but not least, they have not been uh, formally uh, validated, have never been formally validated. So someone, uh, someone uh, particularly in the hematology uh, field uh, has suggested to use the HLH 2004 diagnostic guidelines uh, to diagnose MAS. As you know, these, these guidelines were developed for the genetic forms of uh, hemophagocytic syndrome, which are different in some aspects, uh, although clinically very similar to MAS, but these criteria are not adequate to, uh, to uh, detect early a complication which occurs in the context of a highly inflammatory disease such as systemic JAA. For instance, if we wait uh, that platelet count drops be below 100,000 or that uh, the fibrogen level uh, decreases below uh, uh, 150 milligram DL, it might be too late for our patient. In, in, a, in an inflammatory disease such as systemic JA, it is more important to value the relative drop from a highly, uh, from a high value, for instance, of platelets and of fibrogen, uh, rather than to wait uh, for the level of this uh, laboratory test to, to decrease below a certain threshold. Because we know, for instance, that in a patient with axial system EJA, if platelets decrease from 600,000 to 350 in 24, 48 hours, so 350 is still normal, but a decrease of 20, uh, 250,000 is highly significant. And the same applies to fibrinogen. Another problem with this criteria is, the, is that ferritin level 500 is too low to discriminate MAS from active system EJA because we know that. Uh, Many children with, uh, high dis with, dis with active systemic joint idiopathic arthritis have a background uh, ferritin uh, uh, far above 500, 1,000, uh, 1,500. It's not, uh, it's not uncommon to see in the context of that active systemic J without evidence of MAS. But when MAS occurs, starts, ferritin level increased markedly to 15,000, 30,000, uh, and even more. So the, the relative increase in ferritin, uh, again, is much more important than the absolute threshold. So, but since we uh, like uh, to demonstrate uh, our, uh, let's say, our hypothesis in an evidence-based way, we uh, compared the diagnostic performance uh, of the HLA 2004 guidelines in two different formats, the more sophisticated lab parameters were, immunological parameters were not available, and also the bone marrow aspirate was not made in many patients with uh, uh, MAS or system AJA. 
uh, we compared anyway this, uh, the, these guidelines with the preliminary, the original MAS guidelines, and also with uh, three versions of the original preliminary MAS guidelines with the addition of ferritin at three different thresholds. As you see, in the end, uh, the, best, uh, the best balance between sensitivity and specificity and the uh, higher kappa value was still provided by the uh, preliminary MAS guidelines. So the, the HLH, HLH criteria were extremely specific, which means that if a patient met this criteria, he or she had MAS, no doubt, but this criteria picked up only one third of MAS cases. So this means that they missed in the more complete uh, format uh, as many as two thirds of diagnosis of MAS, which is a, a limitation. Unexpectedly, the addition of ferritin did not increase the performance of the criteria. And this is probably due to the fact that ferritin level is extremely variable across diverse patients with MAS. And so it's very difficult to set a threshold that fit, fits to all uh, patients. Anyway, because uh, none of the old criteria was entirely satisfactory uh, a few years ago, uh, we decided to start a multinational effort which was aimed to develop new well-established classification criteria for MAS complication system EJA and I personally led this project which was uh, based on, uh, on uh, three subsequent steps. First of all we made the Delphi survey among international pediatric rheumatologists which were aimed, uh, was aimed to select the clinical laboratory features that were felt by these experts as potentially more important for inclusion in the criteria. Then we launched a large scale data collection, which was aimed to collect real patient data from MAS and from two potentially confusable conditions. That is with two conditions that uh, uh, are potentially, uh, can be con potentially confused with MAS in the clinical setting. And these conditions were uh, instances of active systemic JIA without evidence of MAS and uh, instances of acute febrile infection requiring hospitalization. So we, through statistical analysis, we aim to identify those clinical laboratory or histopathological features that were best suited to distinguish, to discriminate MAS from the two potentially confusable conditions. And so once uh, the data collection was completed, the statistical analysis were made, we ended up the project with a consensus conference, which uh, gathered the, a group of uh, selected experts, which uh, were, uh, let's say, were, were committed to develop the final criteria based on the results of statistical analysis, on the analysis of real patient data, and of course, on their personal opinions and expertise. So the Delphi survey, I won't go uh, present you these data for sake of time and because they have been published uh, in the journal of rheumatology. If you are interested, you can take a look at this paper. If you do, do not have access to the paper, just drop me an email. I would be more than happy to send you the PDF of the study. So the data collection was, uh, was involved, uh, uh, you see, uh, 95 investigators from 33 counties all over the world and we collected uh, the database was handled at uh, my hospital, at the Gazzini Institute. Uh, 1,111 patients with, uh, with uh, MAS or with one of the two confusable conditions that you see here, the sample distribution. And at this time, the project became, uh, became a multidisciplinary because beside pediatric rheumatologists, we were joined by a group of pediatric, also hematologists belonging to the Istiocyte Society. And then the consensus conference, which was preceded by a number of, of pre-meeting uh, web consensus evaluations. So we ask uh, the experts that were selected to make uh, a number of evaluation. We show you some details uh, uh, in a while. And also we run a number of uh, statistical analysis to uh, end up with uh, the, uh, let's say, a, a, um, an adequate uh, um, bunch of data which should have enabled the expert at the consensus conference to try to reach agreement uh, on the final classification criteria. So this is the, the, the expert panel was composed of 27 specialists, 19 of them were rheumatologists and eight uh, hematologists. So the, the, what we first asked to these experts was to examine real patients 
which could have MAS or one of the two confusable conditions. We submit the patient profiles of uh, this patient mixed without, of course, uh, uh, telling them the diagnosis. And then we ask them to classify each of these patients uh, as having MAS, in their opinion, positive for MAS or not having MAS. Patients for which there was no consensus, uh, that is, for, for whom uh, less than 80% of experts uh, did not reach consensus or uh, diagnosis of MAS or no MAS were discarded. And this, uh, these evaluations have been simply based on clinical and laboratory data at the onset of the disease because we were interested in the establishing criteria that could help to diagnose and recognize and classify, of course, MAS at disease, at its uh, uh, onset. So we, for this, uh, this exercise, uh, we selected a total of 428 uh, patients' profiles from the uh, entire patient samples, 161 at MAS, 140 system AJA, active system AJA without evidence of MAS, and 127 systemic infections. These diagnoses were made by the original uh, caring uh, treating physicians who had seen the patient in the clinical setting. So were clinical diagnosis by the physician who saw these patients. So these, uh, these participants were asked to work extremely hard, not that hard as in this picture, pictures, but uh, quite hard because we ran three, three subsequent rounds of evaluations. And, uh, and this is the, an, ex the, an, uh, an example of the profile for each patient that was submitted to these experts. So we uh, listed the main clinical features of MAS uh, and then uh, wrote whether the patient had or did not have is those this feature. For instance, this patient had fever, lymphadenopathy, mandelomegaly, but did not have spinomegaly, hemorrhagic manifestation, jaundice, and so on and so forth. And also we listed the laboratory features at uh, onset with their normal range. You see, for instance, this patient had anemia, leukopenia, neutropenia, leukopenia, the platelets, uh, 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 transaminase is elevated, fibrinogen dropped, and ferritin 10,000. So in the end, uh, I, we asked the expert, so uh, after having reviewed these clinical features and laboratory features, do you think, do you feel that this patient have MAS? Yes or no? I guess you agree that the, a patient with these features clearly has MAS. So we, uh, the, these experts uh, make this evaluation for all, all uh, 428 patient profiles for three times. So very hard work. So in the end, we were successful because we had uh, uh, more than 90% of the profiles for which uh, uh, consensus was reached. For, that is for which uh, more than 80% of experts agreed that they had MAS or they did not have MAS. Interestingly enough, 47 patients which were classified as MAS by the treating physician was not confirmed uh, with this diagnosis by the experts. A few patients with systemic JA or infection were classified, however, as MAS, but very few, very few. So then we had these 39 profiles, which were the gold standard for the study. And then on these profiles, we tested the, a number, a large number of classification criteria, criteria derived from the literature, uh, the one that I've shown you before, uh, premier guidelines, modified guidelines, HLH 2004 criteria. And then we derived a, a large uh, number of theoretical criteria, which were generated from study data, data using two uh, different statistical approaches, combination of criteria approach. And I won't go through the details for sake of time. And uh, if by assigning a weight to each clinical laboratory variable through a multivariable regression analysis by constructing MAS score. So we selected, uh, we, we, we tested almost 1,000 potential definitions. We selected 45 based on their statistical performance. We were quite uh, demanding in, in, in uh, to uh, retain a, a, a set of criteria. We required a kappa value above 0.4. So you look at the sensitivity and specificity are under the curve, should have been above 0.9. We made an exception for the historical definitions because due to their historical meaning and importance were retained even though their performance were below the established threshold. So we ended up this project by holding a consensus conference in Genoa in 20, 
14 in this beautiful villa which belonged, uh, belonged to the, our hospital. Unfortunately, it has been now sold, but anyway, this was a very good venue. And these are the experts which participated in the, in the consensus cover. They come from all over the world. They were smiling, Italian, Italian food, Italian weather, Italian wine, that was close to the side, so the, the, the sea, so this helped very much. Of course, they, 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 so they forgave us for such a hard work, but they work again very much for two days. Uh, the, we, the, the, the goal was to examine these uh, 45 definitions which were left and to examine each of them and to rank them from one to five. One, uh, uh, the, 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 the five to the best and one to the less, uh, less uh, let's say, uh, appreciated. So these are the tables. One table was moderated by Nicola Ruperto and another table by Herbin Brunner, Nicola Ruperto from Genoa, Herbin Brunner from Cincinnati. So we tested uh, the fortified definition. We made a number of uh, subsequent runs of uh, uh, rounds of assessments. And in the end, uh, we were lucky because uh, we, uh, a consensus was reached on the final definition, which was retained uh, in the final criteria and became, uh, the, became uh, the, the final 2016 uh, MAS uh, classification criteria. So based on this criteria, a patient which should be febrile, fever is mandatory, which known or even suspected, suspicion is enough, systemic JA is classified as having MAS if the patient has ferritin above 684 nanogram per liter, this is another mandatory criterion, plus at least two of the following four abnormalities. You see platelet count less than 181, elevated transaminases, elevated triglycerides, and 506 less than 350. So it is not surprising for what I said before that the threshold level for platelets and fibrogen is within the normal limit. But again, for a highly inflammatory disease like a systemic JA, this level is, 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 is low. And as I said once more, it is more important to value the, the change over time rather than the achievement of a particular threshold value. So these criteria have been endorsed by, by the main uh, international uh, rheumatology networks, by the EULAR in Europe, by the American College of Rheumatology in, uh, in, it, in, uh, in the North America. So they have become the official criteria for both this uh, organization. I am finished. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Ravali. We really, really did enjoy your presentation and uh, we learned a lot. Uh, in fact, there are two questions uh, in the chat box. Uh, if you uh, let me ask you, and uh, one of them is that, um, let me see, please. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ravelli, for your very beautiful presentation. Uh, on behalf Thank of you. all our exec executive and uh, also scientific committee, uh, I should thank you, especially Dr. Ziai, uh, send you uh, some, um, uh, some message and uh, thank you in person. Thank you so much. Uh, professor, uh, one of the, these questions is that, uh, do you agree with the hypothesis that uh, MISC is a new presentation or similar syndrome of macrophage activating syndrome? So M MIC, you mean uh, the Kawasaki-like condition associated with SARS-CoV-2? Yes. yes uh, this, this, is, this is a very interesting uh, question. Uh, uh, so I think that uh, the discussion should be more uh, if uh, MIC is similar to Kawasaki disease or is a kind of variant more aggressive, uh, let's say deformed by the virus. But uh, I think that Professor Singh uh, would uh, be more uh, suited than me to address to answer this question. But I've been very much involved in this uh, discussion uh, internationally, and I will give a talk uh, on uh, Sunday night at the American College of Rheumatology on this uh, on this issue. Regarding, I think that uh, uh, MAS uh, can occur in Kawasaki disease. We know it's probably more common than uh, usually thought. Uh, MAS has been seen in uh, uh, MIS-C, many of these patients uh, had uh, elevated ferritin and other features of MAS. Uh, but I think that uh, kind of toxic shock syndrome with myocarditis and shock, uh, which also can complicate uh, Kawasaki syndrome, uh, is more common than overt MAS uh, 
in, uh, in uh, patients with, with MIS-C. What we know is that adult patients with uh, lung uh, disease uh, uh, develop, some of them, those with the uh, most... Uh, uh, with a little, a more severe course, develop a cytokine storm syndrome, which is probably within the spectrum of MAS, within the lung. This is what uh, makes uh, their uh, disease course uh, so complicated and, uh, and risky. Thank you, Professor Robert, for your uh, nice uh, response. Another question is that, uh, what's your opinion about the probable uh, primary immune deficiency in children who experience MAS in systematic yeah, yeah, yeah. Primary, primary immune deficiency uh, is a different, uh, is a different uh, condition. Uh, so children with system AJA uh, usually do not have uh, immune deficiency. They are immune competent. So it's, uh, uh, I, I think I, I can't answer this question. So immune deficiency, I think is, is rarely complicated by MAS because, you know, MAS is a hyperinflammatory condition. So it's a, uh, is due to a, an uncontrolled, uh, uh, dysregulated, uh, excessive immune response, which, uh, which uh, leads to a, an overwhelming, massive hypersecretion of pro-inflammatory cytokines, uh, such as IL-6, interferon gamma, and IL-1, and, so, and, and others, uh, IL-18. And this is the reason why MAS occurs. So this is, is, is a different uh, uh, scenario as compared to to immune deficiencies. Thank you very much. Uh, another question: There is um, how can we different? Uh, how can we differentiate between MAS due to JIA and other conditions such as infections or other rheumatologic disorders by laboratory index? So, how can we differentiate MAS system JIA from other other forms of MAS? So, you know, it's uh, uh, usually when MAS occurs after the start. Uh, of uh, system AJA, so we already know that the patient uh, has uh, system AJA, so it is not uh, difficult to diagnose uh, uh, MAS. However, we know that in uh, around uh, one quarter of patients, MAS can occur at the onset of system AJA, and even when arthritis is not yet present. So in that setting, it's difficult to distinguish MAS from uh, virus-associated HLH, or even from another uh, uh, from uh, MAS due to uh, other kind of infection. For instance, I don't know if in Iran you have this, uh, this, this infection, Leishmania visceralis, Leishmaniosis is endemic in many parts of Italy. So I have seen not, not, that, not in systemic JA, but for instance, in lupus, I have seen uh, at least a couple of cases of MAS, because we know that MAS can occur in lupus also, is a bit different from that of uh, that is seen in system AJ because lupus is different. The underlying disease is, is, is different. But MAS, Leishmania can, can give a clinical and laboratory feature that is indistinguishable from AS. So in lupus, it's very, very difficult, can be very difficult to, dis to discriminate lupus related MAS from Leishmania related MAS. Leishmania can be facilitated by the immune depression that is seen in lupus due to therapies, for instance, but, or to the disease itself. But since the, the treatments are completely different, you, we, need to, we need to be careful not to uh, confuse, to, to misdiagnose leishmaniosis, uh, uh, MAS due to leishmaniosis from uh, MAS uh, uh, as MAS uh, uh, due to lupus. Really do appreciate your response. Uh, there is another question also. Um, the decreasing level of uh, platelet or fibrinogen or increasing level of ferritin I mean, the dy dynamic changes could helpful for us. Could it be helpful for us to uh, early diagnosis of MAS? Yes, yeah, this is a very good question because, uh, okay, for sake of time, uh, I, I, I skipped the, the second part of the project, uh, which was uh, uh, discussed and accomplished in the second day of the consensus conference, which was aimed to identify the laboratory uh, parameters whose change over time is most uh, uh, relevant and useful to diagnose MAS early. And uh, they, these results have been published in the RMD Open a few years ago, but just uh, uh, a summary. So the three lab values whose change over time is most uh, useful and relevant to detect MAS timely are ferritin, platelets, 
and uh, transaminases. So definitely, decreasing platelets and increasing platelet and transaminases when they occur together in the setting of active system J should be definitely an alert, an alarm sign for the potential occurrence of AVS. Thank you very much, Professor Raoli, for your uh, interesting, comprehensive responses. Uh, now uh, we are going to have an, uh, another lecture by Professor Surjit Singh from India with the lecture on Kawasaki disease at uh, Chandigarh, North India, uh, our experiences over 26 years. Professor Singh, we are all ears. Very good friend of mine. Hello, Surjit. Hi, Angelo. Thank you. Yeah, Professor Surjit, I should uh, thank you for your patience. Thank you very much, sir. It's a pleasure being here. Thank you very much for the invitation. The pleasure is ours. Thank you. Uh, good evening. So I shall be recounting our experience with Kawasaki disease at Chandigarh, um, which is a city in the northern part of India. I work in the advanced pediatric center here and I look after the pediatric clinical immunology and rheumatology unit uh, at the center. We diagnosed our first patient with Kawasaki disease in the year 1994. At that time, it appeared that this is an uncommon condition uh, in the Indian setup. But over the last 26 years, it has become very obvious that this disease is rather common and that many patients are being missed um, uh, all over the country. So as we all know, the condition was first described by a Japanese pediatrician, Dr. Tomisaku Kawasaki, who incidentally passed away this year on the 5th of June at the age of 95. He published his first report of 50 cases of what he called mucocutaneous lymph node syndrome in the Japanese journal Erurgi, which basically means Japanese Journal of Allergy. This was a very comprehensive uh, clinical description running into 44 pages in which Dr. Kawasaki described uh, all the clinical findings that he had recorded on these patients. Kawasaki disease is a rather common condition and the three countries with the world's highest incidence of Kawasaki disease are Japan, Korea, and Taiwan, all in the northeastern part of Asia. These three countries not only have the world's highest incidence of Kawasaki disease, but for reasons which are not clear, this incidence is still increasing. So this is the incidence curve of Japan, this is of Korea, and this is of Taiwan. So these curves have still not plateaued down as compared to the rest of the world where the incidence has plateaued down. Why these three countries still have an increasing incidence of Kawasaki disease is still not clear. We have been documenting the uh, incidence of Kawasaki disease based on our hospital experience at, at Chandigarh. And we have showed a steady increase in incidence of Kawasaki disease over the last two and a half decades. We also note that there is a bimodal seasonality with peaks in October and May. Over the years 2009 to 2014, the incidence showed a further increase. And during this time, the mean incidence was somewhere around a little above five per 100,000 children uh, below five. This incidence figure is lower than the reported incidence from the um, uh, European Union. The median age of diagnosis uh, during this time is much higher than what has been reported from other countries. But this is probably because 
we have been missing the diagnosis in very small children in whom uh, Kawasaki disease is probably uh, being confused with uh, other viral with viral infections. So it's this is a false um, uh, high age of uh, 7.7 .7 years. Um, this may really not be true. As I said, the mean incidence at Chandigarh during this time, 2009 to 14, was around 5.35 per 100,000 children. Over the last five years, we have documented a further increase in incidence from 5.64 to something like a little above 10. And now our incidence figures are comparable to the incidence reported from Europe. What are the guidelines for diagnosis of Kawasaki disease? Dr. Tomisaku Kawasaki himself suggested some guidelines based on his original description of 50 patients. And since that time, over the last 53 years, there have been several revisions of these guidelines. But essentially, whatever Dr. Kawasaki described in 1967 still holds true. After Dr. Kawasaki's description, we had the Japanese Ministry of Health guidelines in 1970. But at that time, the coronary artery abnormalities had still not been recognized. And of course, at that time, there was no effective treatment for Kawasaki disease. After that, we had the consensus guidelines in 1989. And then, of course, the American Heart Association guidelines in 2004. In 2017, the American Heart Association gave its revised set of guidelines. And um, there have been some minor changes um, in, in, uh, in, in these guidelines as compared to the 2004 guidelines. But essentially, uh, the, the, the principal features remain the same which is erythema and cracking of lips, strawberry tongue, erythema of oral and pharyngeal mucosa, bilateral bulbar conjunctival injection, rash, which can be very variable, but is almost never vesicular. And then erythema and edema of the hands and feet in the acute phase, and the typical periangual desquamation in the subacute phase. Cervical lymphadenopathy, which for some reason, we don't know why, is usually unilateral and one node more than 1.5 centimeter meets this criteria. So the 2017 guidelines, there were certain changes in the nuances uh, of the uh, criteria, but essentially uh, not much had changed between 2004 and 2017. There is usually no problem in diagnosing the classic cases of Kawasaki disease. And most pediatricians uh, in India now are familiar with diagnosing Kawasaki disease. So this is a nine months old boy who had fever for eight days, extreme irritability, red lips and tongue. And there is usually no problem in diagnosing uh, such a baby. A five-year-old boy, fever for six days, extreme irritability, with red lips and tongue, again, the diagnosis will usually not be missed. However, in infants, diagnosing Kawasaki disease can sometimes be a challenge because the clinical features are more subtle. So in this 10-month-old boy, he had fever, he had increased irritability, which was initially thought to be because of meningitis, he was put on antibiotics, then he developed a rash, and then he developed the typical swelling over dorsum of hands and feet. And it was at this time that the uh, concerned unit thought of Kawasaki disease and treated the patient. This swelling over dorsum of hands and feet is rather specific for Kawasaki disease. And there are very few medical, con medical conditions in children where you would get this swelling other than Kawasaki disease. A five-year-old boy who had fever and cervical lymphadenopathy. And this was initially thought to be because of uh, suppurative lymph uh, lymphadenitis. And he was given antibiotics, but the fever went on and on 
and later the child developed a rash. He developed the red cracked lips. There was high CRP, raised ESR, thrombocytosis, and then the diagnosis of Kawasaki disease was made. Like all conditions, like all diseases, there are several caveats to the diagnosis of Kawasaki disease. And it is these caveats which make the uh, disease so very challenging. Some patients with Kawasaki disease would not meet the diagnostic criteria. And this is known as incomplete Kawasaki disease. And it is believed that almost one third of patients with Kawasaki disease have incomplete forms of the disease, which basically means that the criteria that we have for Kawasaki disease are not specific enough for diagnosis of Kawasaki disease. A two-year-old boy who had fever for seven days and rash, there was no clue to the cause of fever. He was given uh, broad-spectrum antimicrobials but the fever persisted. Then the baby developed perianal peeling. Now this perianal peeling is very specific for Kawasaki disease. And this perianal peeling does not occur in any other known medical uh, disease. But <clears throat> this child did not have the other criteria for Kawasaki disease. So obviously, this baby had incomplete Kawasaki disease. This perianal peeling is an important clinical finding because it usually appears much earlier than the pathognomonic periungual peeling, which usually occurs after day nine or 10. This perianal peeling can be seen in the first few days of fever. So if you have a small baby in whom the fever is persisting and you don't have a reasonable cause for the fever, one must open up the nappy and look for the perianal peeling. So this was a febrile child. Again, no cause for the fever and the baby developed reactivation of the BCG site. No other clinical features. So this again is almost pathognomonic of Kawasaki disease. Reactivation of the BCG site occurs more commonly in infants and for some reason is more common in countries like Japan and Taiwan. We don't see it very often in India for reasons uh, which are not very clear. In India, all babies get BCG vaccination at birth, but uh, we have not seen too many patients with BCG site reactivation. But if in a febrile child you see such reactivation, then this is virtually pathognomonic of Kawasaki disease. This was a five-year-old boy who had been running fever for 15 days. He had rash and he had red eyes. Now, this was the clinical picture of this baby. We sought a dermatology consultation and the differential diagnosis was that could this be Stevens-Johnson syndrome? But the fever was high grade and it was persisting. And in the beginning of this illness, the baby also had had red eyes. So we thought that this is more like Kawasaki disease. We gave the child intravenous immunoglobulin and on follow-up, the baby developed very prominent Bose lines and then he developed onychomedesis sloughing off of the nails. So this was indeed an unusual presentation of Kawasaki disease with lip changes that were reminiscent of Stephen Johnson syndrome. This was a five-year-old boy who presented with fever for 17 days. Now, whenever children develop prolonged fever in India, infectious diseases are always um, uh, 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 the first possibility. So he was thought to have enteric fever. He was given treatment for enteric fever, but the fever persisted. And then he developed irritability, but there were no other symptoms and signs. When this baby reached our institute, the treating team thought that 
the child has received adequate antibiotics there has been the workup has been negative so could this be infective endocarditis on a normal valve so they got an echo done and echo showed large coronary aneurysms we subsequently got a dual source um, ct and angio coronary angiography done and this baby by that time had had giant coronary aneurysms but he had only these clinical features so this child again definitely had incomplete kawasaki disease but with disastrous consequences some patients with kawasaki disease have unusual clinical presentations and this is what is called as atypical kawasaki disease so this was a 4 year old boy who had fever for 25 days cough and respiratory distress he was put on ceftriaxone and cloxacillin but the fever kept on persisting cultures were negative someone in the rounds noticed periangual discrimination so the workup was repeated and there you have thrombocytosis raised crp elevated esr the echo was normal so based on these findings he was given intravenous immunoglobulin and the fever responded so pulmonary presentation of kawasaki disease can be a diagnostic challenge and this often results in delayed diagnosis because the focus is often on the lungs when it should be on the whole child incomplete kawasaki and atypical kawasaki disease these are by no means milder forms of kd but in fact the converse may well be true the reason is that when the baby presents with either incomplete or atypical kawasaki disease the diagnosis is likely to be delayed and therefore you are likely to have more complications missing a diagnosis of kawasaki disease i need not emphasize can have disastrous consequences this was a 17 month girl who had been running fever for 3 weeks there was excessive irritability there was a rash when the treating pediatrician got a urine examination done they found pyuria so when you the the child already had fever when they had pyuria they thought this is because of urinary tract infection so they gave antibiotics for urinary tract infection but the fever persisted the child was investigated on lines of a urinary tract infection but multiple urine cultures were sterile ultrasound was normal since the fever was persisting lot of radiological investigations were done which were normal and of course mcu and ivp were also done again uh, they reveal nothing later someone noticed periangual desquamation so this baby workup at this time showed anemia the platelets were not too high but the esr was very high and crp was very high but by this time the baby already had developed coronary artery aneurysms involving all uh, uh, the coronary arteries so in this case the 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 pyuria that this child had was not because of urinary tract infection but it was the sterile pyuria of kawasaki disease and kawasaki disease is perhaps the commonest cause of sterile pyuria in children so whenever in a febrile child you have pus cells in the urine cultures are sterile you should think of kawasaki disease and work up accordingly and this is the dual source ct coronary angiography films of this patient Uh, this child had developed large aneurysms myocarditis can be an integral part of kawasaki disease and it is now believed that myocarditis occurs in all children with kawasaki disease it is just that uh, uh, we are we may not be in a position to pick up myocarditis because um, uh, it's uh, the all that you can do to pick up myocarditis is in fact echocardiography and echocardiography is not a very accurate tool to pick up myocarditis and uh, children with kd can at times be lurking around in the intensive care unit because of kawasaki disease shock syndrome 
and Kawasaki disease shock syndrome is liable to be mistaken for septic shock syndrome. This was a five-year boy who had a subacute febrile illness, conjunctival injection, redness of lips, strawberry tongue, and irritability. He had anemia. There was the total white cell counts were high. There was predominant polymorphs. Platelets were initially normal, but then they started climbing and uh, he had thrombocytosis. The transaminases were elevated, but look at the uh, serum pro-BNP. This was very, very high. 2D echocardiography showed a low ejection fraction, but the coronary showed subtle signs in the form that the Z scores were a little high. The coronaries were bright. The left uh, anterior descending, there was no distal tapering. Right coronary artery was bright and ectectic, and there was mild pericardial effusion. These are all soft signs of Kawasaki disease. This child suddenly became very, very unwell, and he went on to develop full blown uh, macrophage activation syndrome. So the hemoglobin fell from 104 to the 60s and 70s. The total counts fell drastically. Absolute neutrophil count fell. The platelets went very low. Ferritin was very high. Fibrinogen uh, was on the higher side. And uh, uh, so this child had a very hectic stay in the intensive care unit. We gave him three uh, doses of intravenous immunoglobulin. We uh, pulsed him with methyl prednisolone followed by oral prednisolone. We also gave him infliximab and oral cyclosporin. And he required pressure support, he required ventilation, but ultimately uh, recovered. So this is one of the most serious um, complications of Kawasaki disease when they present with myocarditis and macrophage activation syndrome and both of these can sometimes come present together. The child gradually recovered, but fortunately, the coronary arteries did not show uh, many changes. Kawasaki disease is a disease of young children. Most children are below the age of five. It occurs in preschool children, but it can sometimes present in older children and adults. And that is when it can again be associated with a lot of coronary complications. And uh, such patients are liable to be diagnosed very late because you don't think of Kawasaki disease in adolescents and adults. So we had a 30 years old uh, uh, female who presented with fever. She had red eyes, a red tongue, a generalized body rash, and she also had a lower motor neuron type facial palsy. So fever persisted for several days. She was given antibiotics. Then she developed a rash. And when she developed a rash, she, the parents sought a dermatology consultation and it was a dermatologist who noticed these changes in the palms, who noticed the periungual disquamation, who noticed the strawberry tongue, and he referred the patient um, uh, to, to our institute. And this was one instance when in children's ward, we admitted a 30-year-old patient uh, for treatment of Kawasaki disease. So by the time we saw the patient, the, she already had Bose lines. So whenever Kawasaki disease occurs in uh, adolescents or in adults, the diagnosis is likely to be delayed. And these patients are at increased risk of development of coronary artery abnormalities. Fortunately for this patient, uh, she responded well to intravenous immunoglobulin, but we also gave her infliximab because of the severity of the disease uh, that she had and uh, she recovered completely. This was another patient. She was 27 years old. 
She presented with fever, rashes, cervical lymphadenopathy, desquamation, and red lips and tongue. And she had peels of skin uh, coming out of the hands. The echocardiography did show aneurysms, although at this age, it's very difficult to get a proper acoustic window, but she had aneurysms. However, she responded to IVIG and these aneurysms settled uh, uh, on follow-up. So Kawasaki disease is a common childhood illness. As I said, it is more common in the Northeast um, Asian countries. In Japan, the incidence now is well above 320 per 100,000 children below five. Approximately 1% of Japanese children develop Kawasaki disease before they reach the age of 10. And incidence in Japan, Korea and Taiwan is still increasing. Beware of young children with unexplained fever for more than five days. And one has to be on the lookout for the clinical findings of Kawasaki disease. It can at times be a diagnostic nightmare because the, none of these principal clinical findings are pathognomonic of Kawasaki disease. And you have to be smart enough to pick up the temporal sequence of the clinical features of Kawasaki disease. Otherwise, you will miss the diagnosis. Kawasaki disease is rather unforgiving and missing out on a diagnosis can have disastrous consequences. However, the clinical features of Kawasaki disease um, are rather um, vague. The diagnostic criteria are still anything but specific and therefore diagnosis is more art than science. And this is not what it should be in the 21st century. It remains a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. So this is Dr. Kawasaki uh, at the uh, International Kawasaki Disease Symposium in Yokohama in June 2018. Here he is uh, with his two daughters. And this is Dr. Kawasaki uh, with some of our residents from Chandigarh at the Yokohama Symposium. We lost Dr. Kawasaki uh, this year on 5th of June. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Singh, for your interesting, nice uh, lecture. Uh, we really do miss Professor Kawasaki. Uh, and um, let me see if there's any questions. Uh, yes, there's a one question, Professor, if you let me to ask. Do we need a new criteria for atypical incomplete Kawasaki? It's different from incomplete Kawasaki Kawasaki that is defined by two clinical manifestations and some laboratory findings. Some patients do not have any clinical findings except fever. Do you agree with Professor DIE? Well, um, you know, yes, this is a very good question, but I'm afraid uh, I don't have an answer. Because Kawasaki disease when you say it is incomplete, you know, it is incomplete at a point of time. The child with Kawasaki disease starts with fever. And in the first few days, the child may have some clinical findings. If you miss these clinical findings, fever is persisting. The next pediatrician who sees the child may not see those findings. And by this time, the child may or may not have other findings. So you may think that it is incomplete at that point of time, while in reality, some of those clinical findings may have disappeared later on. There is some confusion whether incomplete and atypical Kawasaki disease refer to the same condition or whether you should treat them as two different conditions. We prefer differentiating incomplete from atypical Kawasaki disease. Incomplete is when the criteria are not being met, while atypical is when there are atypical, unusual clinical findings. For instance, involvement of the uh, renal system, involvement of the brain, that is what we would call as atypical Kawasaki disease. Yes, we, we need to have strict criteria for all, all types of Kawasaki disease. Uh, 
Thank you very much for your comprehensive, nice uh, response. Uh, if there is anything, any uh, other questions? No, there, we don't have any questions. Um, if uh, I wanted to ask if there, uh, if uh, Dr. Badron is uh, with us or not, please uh, raise the hand. Professor Badron, our uh, our next session is, uh, is with afraid, Professor Badron. I'm afraid she is not with us right now. Uh, as we're uh, unfortunately a bit uh, late uh, uh, for our program. Who is not with you? Uh, Professor Badron uh, is not uh, online right now. So, uh, there is a problem. The noise, yes. Oh, that's my helicopter to pick me up. <laughs> Um, um, so, okay. okay. Um, so, wrap it up. Very nice lecture, Dr. Singh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for your lecture. Uh, because we are a bit uh, later than our program, uh, we, uh, we are afraid that we are late. And uh, if you are agree, we uh, do not play the pre-recorded presentation of Professor Bandron, and, but it, is, uh, it will be available on our YouTube channel. And... Um, uh, from each one and every one of us here at Children's Medical Center, Tehran University of Medical Science, we would like to say a particular thank to Professor Herendish, Professor Fanos, Professor Ravelli, Professor Singh, and also Professor Padron that uh, have prepared uh, a presentation for us. Whose support uh, we are honored to have, and despite the time difference, we are more than happy to get involved. And a special thank to all uh, to you also, uh, uh, and uh, for our and, uh, fantastic audiences. Uh, I should also thank all of you, and uh, special thank to the, uh, dear Professor Khairandish, Professor Fanus, Professor Rabadi, and Professor C to share their knowledge, their science with us. Thank you very much and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Thank you. Thank you. for having us. Thank you very bye much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Yeah, just uh, stay safe. Minutes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Leave again, on study. Uh, uh, if you want to receive a certificate of attendance in this Congress, make sure to register on our website and reserve a seat on your desired panel. And don't forget to follow us on our YouTube channel and uh, to be updated about next events. And again, our, uh, our sessions are available in the, our YouTube channel and downloads. And our, the presentation of Professor Badram will be available um, and you can download it. Thank you very much. Be safe and take care of yourself. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.